Hi there, and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, Inertial Breakthroughs for Autonomous Vehicles. Sponsored by Inside GNSS, KVH, and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leaders in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders, as today's webinar is about hearing the in-depth technical presentation that will provide valuable information and insight for all who are interested in autonomous navigation. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during our Ask the Experts panel sessions with both of our panel members. Now we've invited you along with over 300 professionals from across 35 countries representing a variety of industries and regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Now before we get started, uh, Richard Fisher, publisher inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned Systems, would like to take just a moment to welcome you and introduce our sponsor and main moderator for today's session. So over to you, Richard. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, on behalf of the Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems team, we extend a warm welcome to our international audience for today's webinar, Inertial Breakthroughs for Autonomous Vehicles. We're delighted you could join us. Now, I'd like to introduce Sean McCormick, uh, who is the Senior Director of Global Inertial System Sales at KVH Industries. Sean? Thank you, Richard. I, too, would like to first welcome all participants and panelists on behalf of KVH Industries. We thank you for joining today. KVH is a leading innovator for high-performance sensors and integrated inertial systems, delivering extremely accurate position and assured navigation for various autonomous platforms. Having produced more than 120,000 fiber optic gyros for standalone systems and fully integrated inertial solutions, KVH's FOGs and FOG-based IMUs are used today in a wide variety of applications, ranging from optical antenna and sensor stabilization systems, mobile mapping solutions, and autonomous platforms spanning across the land, sea, and air. Continually investing in our products, KVH recently developed photonic chip-based technology that we plan to integrate into our fiber optic gyro product line in the very near future. We'll share a bit of this with you today and hope you'll find this webinar beneficial to your own development efforts. Thank you again for your participation. At this time, I'm going to pass it back to Richard to get the show going. Thanks a lot, Sean. That's exciting. Um, I'd like to now introduce Alan Cameron, who's the editor-in-chief of Inside GNSS Magazine and the PNT editor for Inside Unmanned Systems. He's covered the GNSS, PNT, and autonomous vehicle industries research communities as a writer and a magazine editor since 2000, focusing on technical issues around continuous, reliable position in the navigation. Alan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Richard. Hello, everyone. Welcome to you from around the world. I can see from our attendance panel that we do have uh, truly an international audience and a wide variety of interests. Uh, just scanning what, what you've entered uh, when you registered, I see that people want to know about inertial for autonomous vehicles, uh, about sensor fusion, and about the new performances, new performance that is achievable with new uh, with the new photonic chip and other advances in gyroscopes. This is good because it's exactly what we're going to present to you today with our panel of two distinguished experts. Now we all know that the landscape of navigation is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and that the introduction of autonomous vehicles brings even more change, uh, more dynamic uh, demands on performance, uh, size, weight, and power, and so forth. Uh, there are some things that do not change, and those are the principles of inertial navigation and inertial aiding. They're principles because they do not change. So we're going to take you through what does not change and the most recent exciting changes in this webinar. Uh, but first, before we get started with our panel, uh, which includes Mike Brosh from Ohio University and John Kahn from KVH Industries. Lori, let's get uh, acquainted with our audience a little bit with our first poll question. Absolutely. Uh, coming up on the screen is our first poll question. And we'd like to hear from each of you what type of additional sensors, aids, 
and error bounding techniques are you util utilizing in your autonomous application? So you've got the, some choices there on the screen. Wheel speed sensor, GPS, LiDAR, camera systems, altimeters. Okay, so 36% uh, coming in at wheel speed sensor, 93% uh, GPS, 41 LiDAR, 49 camera systems, and 30% altimeters. So uh, any thoughts on these responses, Alan? Well, no surprise that GPS is the leading uh, additional sensor for autonomous applications. You pretty much can't live without it, uh, just as you can't live without inertial. Uh, we see in second place uh, shared roughly between LiDAR and camera systems, basically uh, optical sensors of one flavor or another, and then a little bit behind that uh, other augmentation sensors, altimeters uh, for UAVs, uh, obviously, and wheel speed sensors for UGVs. Uh, it gives us a good sense of our audience coming from a broad range of applications. Uh, I'm going to dive right in now with uh, introduction to our first speaker. Michael Brosh is the Thomas Professor of Engineering in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Ohio University. He's a principal investigator with the Avionics Engineering Center at the university and has been performing navigation system research for the past 34 years. Mike has taught inertial navigation short courses at Honeywell, Kierfot, and Northrop Grumman and is currently serving on the GNSS Inertial Working Group in RTCA Special Committee 159. He's a fellow of the U.S. Institute of Navigation, serves on the Board of Governors of the IEEE Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society, and is an instrument-rated commercial pilot. Michael, please proceed. Thank you, Alan. Well, it's my privilege to uh, be able to address you today. And uh, what I want to uh, start off with is uh, talking about the role of inertial within navigation. And uh, I, I like to say, I picked this up from a colleague of mine, that the future of navigation, as it has been for quite a while, is inertial plus. Plus what? Well, plus whatever the uh, aiding sensor is that you happen to be utilizing. Uh, we saw quite a number of them uh, in the uh, poll question. But the fact of the matter is that inertial navigation has and will be the center of the navigation suite uh, for the foreseeable future. Why is that? Well, with one sensor suite, one IMU, you're able to determine position, velocity, and attitude. Of course, inertial sensors are immune to interference and jamming. They provide us with very high data rates, and very low data latencies. This is essential for providing uh, the inputs needed for autonomous control systems. And they're relatively noise-free in the short term, but of course, uh, the uh, weakness that they have is they don't provide you with good long-term accuracy by themselves. They're not stable. The errors drift. They grow over time. And of course, the way that we uh, deal with this is by aiding the inertial sensors, the inertial system, uh, with some kind of external source of position, velocity, attitude, other things. And traditionally, this integration has been done with the Kalman filter. So let's uh, just go back to first things first. Remember what it is that we're doing with an inertial measurement unit. Uh, the first thing we're doing, of course, is, is measuring force. Uh, accelerometers don't actually measure acceleration solely. They measure a combination of Newtonian acceleration and the reaction to gravity. So the, um, what we have to be able to do is take the inertial measurements and then compensate them with the gravity field at that point in order to be able to uh, isolate out the desired uh, Newtonian acceleration. Once you have that, of course, then it's just basic uh, math and physics. You're integrating once for velocity and one more time for position. However, uh, that's, of course, the details get to be a bit complicated. Uh, this is showing the uh, continuous time version of the strap-down inertial updating where we're taking the gyroscopes and the uh, accelerometer outputs and then 
determining position, velocity, and attitude. Now, what I'm showing here is a standalone uh, processing, uh, sometimes referred to as free inertial. Of course, uh, we'll later be talking about how we bring in the external aiding. So in the upper left, we have uh, the angular rate measurements from our uh, gyroscopes, so the angular rate of the body frame relative to the inertial frame expressed in uh, body coordinates. And what are we doing with that? Well, of course, we're updating the representation of attitude. Uh, there are multiple ways that you can represent attitude. You can use Euler angles. You can use direction cosine matrices. You can use quaternions. Uh, the direction cosine matrices and quaternions are the, are the most robust. And, of course, quaternions uh, are the most numerically efficient. Uh, I'm illustrating this with, uh, with direction cosines. So uh, based on our gyro measurements, we're using that to update our um, body to nav direction cosine matrix. Uh, if you're operating over sufficiently long intervals of time, you may have to take uh, the uh, earth rate and transport rate into account as well since the local level frame is rotating as the earth rotates and as the vehicle is moving over the surface of the earth. So with, uh, with that, we can update our attitude, and I'm showing here the example of the body to nav direction cosine matrix. From that, we can extract the Euler angles, but of course, that's just um, uh, somewhat on the side with regard to our updating of uh, position and velocity. Uh, the purpose of having the attitude is so that we can take the, um, oh, excuse me, so that we can take the specific force measurements from our accelerometers and be able to resolve them into the reference frame of interest. Now, of course, we do that. We have to compensate with whatever the local value of gravity is. And then, depending on your application, you may or may not have to take Coriolis into account uh, with earth rate, sorry, earth rate and transport rate affecting uh, this uh, update of velocity. So we can uh, integrate in order to get our uh, updated velocity, and then that is used to uh, update our position. We're showing here uh, the example of up updating the earth to nav direction cosine matrix. That's one example. Uh, certainly, you can uh, work in a local level frame as well. Uh, but this is the overall picture, and again, we're taking the gyro and Excel measurements, and we are determining position, velocity, and attitude standalone with no external aiding. However, as we talked about earlier, uh, the, the uh, inertial solution will drift over time. And depending on the quality of the inertial sensor you have, it could drift quite rapidly. So uh, in an aided inertial system, what we are doing is we're seeking to estimate and then correct the inertial system errors. Now, in order to do this optimally, uh, we need to be able to characterize, and that's basically what that means, is to be able to model it mathematically, what these errors are. Uh, as we'll see later, uh, in order to be able to uh, optimally estimate the underlying errors, we have to be able to form predictions, intelligent predictions, and the way we're able to do that is if we have models of how uh, these errors uh, behave and change over time. Now, there's a wide variety of errors in inertial systems, but the big ones, of course, are uh, the gyro and accelerometer biases. So this is an example, uh, the classic Schuler loop, uh, Schuler oscillation uh, that you have in a, in a nav grade inertial system operating over a long period of time. Now, this particular example I'm illustrating the effect of a 100 micro G uh, accelerometer bias that's oriented in the north direction. And what we can see uh, over time is that the position error, and this is the uh, latitude and longitude error, the position error oscillates, and it has a period of oscillation of about 84 minutes, which is the, the Schuler period. Uh, we can see that we're also getting that oscillation in the northeast uh, velocity error. Uh, and then if we go on uh, to the next one, this is another example, only what I have here is a point below one degree per hour uh, gyro bias. Uh, 
Again, you can see the Schuler oscillations happening in the velocity. There's also Schulering going on in the position, although it's riding on top of a longer term trend, which turns out to be a very long uh, period oscillation known as the uh, Foucault oscillation. Uh, the point that I need to make here, though, is for the vast majority of users, and certainly certainly uh, autonomous vehicle users, um, vast majority of them, they are not going to be using a standalone or so-called free inertial um, solution. And so if we go back say, to the, the previous slide with the Excel bias, it's not so much the long-term behavior that we're concerned about, but rather we're much more concerned about the very short-term behavior because presumably we're only coasting off of the uh, inertial system for a brief period of time before we get an external aiding update. So let's take a look at the short term and let's, uh, let's, let's look at the effect of 100 micro G Excel bias and then let's look at a family of gyro biases. So 0.05 degree per hour, half a degree an hour, five degree an hour gyro biases. And let's see what happens, how, how these impact our uh, position error. And what we can see in the slide here is that the 100 micro G Excel bias uh, is, is growing as we would expect at the very initial part of that uh, Schuler oscillation uh, to the point where after 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes, we're up to a couple hundred meters of error. But look at the impact, the relative impact of the gyro bias. If we're talking about uh, you know, a fairly good tactical grade gyro, uh, you know, five degrees an hour, uh, it still is dominating the overall performance. Now, of course, we're only looking at a couple of example sensors here, but you can see that in this case, the uh, gyro bias with five degrees an hour is just swamping out whatever impact you may be getting from the accelerometer bias. If we bring down to, say, half a degree an hour gyro bias, uh, then uh, it's, it's better, but of course, over the, over, say, more than five minutes, it's still dominating. Uh, but if we now look at, say, uh, 0.05 degree an hour gyro bias, then its impact is relatively minor compared to uh, the impact of the accelerometer bias. And, and thus, uh, you may have a situation where if you're providing updates over, oh, say, you know, well under a minute uh, in terms of the periodicity of the uh, updates, uh, you may not even necessarily have to model the gyro bias in your calm and filter. Uh, but in any event, what you can see uh, is that the, even, even good gyros uh, can have a pretty dramatic in, impact on uh, short-term performance. And that, uh, that impacts how we, uh, how we do our integration. All right, so uh, before we uh, get into the integration, which we will here in a minute, uh, what we need to do is, of course, remember that there's also noise, and so your uh, angle random walk or your velocity random walk uh, certainly has an important impact on your overall solution for the very simple fact that uh, you cannot uh, predict it and you cannot uh, you cannot smooth it out with the you know traditional filtering. Uh, and you, you, you're stuck in terms of coasting uh, when you're in between updates, uh, external updates, you're stuck with whatever that noise is. And so uh, whereas the biases and uh, other, other errors you may be able to estimate uh, and, and be able to clamp down during a coasting uh, with the noise, you're, you're somewhat stuck with that. And so that's another important factor as you're uh, designing your system. All right, so let's talk about inertial aiding. And uh, as I said at the beginning, traditionally this has been done uh, with the Kalman filter. And the Kalman filter forms intelligent predictions of what the true values are, the values that we're trying to estimate. Uh, it uses these predictions in order to combine with the measurements, basically weighting the predictions and the measurements in an optimal way. And the filter is also able to determine the statistics on its own predictions and its estimates. 
So let's briefly take a look at the two key equations in Coleman filter. One is the uh, system equation, and you have your state vector, which is uh, the vector of variables that you're trying to estimate. In our case, it's going to be things like inertial position velocity attitude error. Uh, the state transition matrix is the deterministic relationship uh, that, that governs how the uh, state vector changes over time. And then, uh, and then we also have a system noise uh, vector, which is modeling the uncertainty. The other key equation is the measurement equation. And what it does is it relates the measurements to the states. So, for example, we may be getting external observations of position from a GNSS receiver, maybe. And so our observations are the differences between the GNSS position and the inertial position. Uh, the data matrix provides the relationship between those observations and the states. And then, of course, take the uh, measurement noise into account. And, and these two equations form the heart of how the Kalman filter is designed. This is the Kalman equation or the Kalman recursion. We don't have time to go through it in detail, of course. But uh, a Kalman gain is determined, which provides the optimal weights on the predictions and measurements. The Kalman is able to determine the statistics on its estimation. Uh, it forms a prediction, and it derived that from the uh, system equation. And the Kalman is able to determine the statistics on its own predictions. And this all happens in an iterative loop as uh, the estimator is, is going on. So uh, what are the errors that we uh, typically will model? Uh, well, of course, uh, we are looking at the position velocity and attitude errors. There are others, so we'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, and recall that these estimated errors are subtracted from the inertial output in order to correct the inertial. Now, if these errors are small, then the errors can be modeled linearly, and then the core Kalman filter framework is sat satisfied. The traditional Kalman filter is assuming that you have linear models. Well, you can keep these errors small if you use feedback. And so you, as you're estimating the errors, you feed it back to the inertial so that the, the error in the inertial output is always small, and thereby we keep it linear so that the Kalman filter equations are satisfied. So uh, what are the errors that can be modeled? Well, we've already talked about inertial position velocity and attitude error. Uh, we can do uh, accelerometer bias and scale factor, gyro bias and scale factor, and then you can go on depending on uh, the detail that you want to uh, satisfy in your, um, in, in your estimator. So you can take into account sensor misalignments, gravity modeling errors, uh, and then another important one, of course, is uh, you may have to model uh, non-Gaussian errors in your aiding source. The core Kalman filter assumes that the measurements are just have independent white Gaussian noise, uh, whereas most aiding sources typically have some non-Gaussian errors in them as well. And, and the way you handle that is just by adding those as additional states in the filter. So this is just an example of a, of a fairly rudimentary uh, set of equations for modeling the position velocity and attitude error, inertial position velocity and attitude error. We don't have time to go through the details. There are some references here. Uh, that you can uh, take a look at uh, uh, later. Uh, but again, uh, it's extremely important to keep in mind that the filter isn't able to estimate in a vacuum. It needs some external a priori information besides the measurements in order to be able to, to do its job. And one of the key things that it needs is a, is a model of the inertial errors. So this is a, an example uh, of how it's actually done in the filter uh, where you're not only uh, estimating inertial position error, velocity error, attitude error, but also, say, accelerometer biases and gyro biases. So uh, let's briefly talk about uh, why the Kalman filter has been around so long. Well, it's, it's obviously a robust framework. Uh, but one of the key things that the Kalman filter brings is its ability to relatively easily integrate a wide variety of sensors 
and in the case of inertial, integrate a wide variety of aiding systems. So uh, as we saw from the poll question, of course, lots and lots of people using GPS and GNSS, but in the unmanned vehicle arena, there is a great need to be able to bring in external sensors beyond uh, GPS. GPS isn't always available. And so as we saw from the poll question, uh, folks are using LIDARs, cameras, and, and other sensors. And the Coleman filter allows you to integrate those uh, aiding sources in a fairly straightforward manner. Now, briefly, as I'm wrapping up, I'll just show you a couple of example architectures. Uh, this is the so-called loosely coupled architecture. And in this case, the GPS or GNSS receiver is outputting uh, so-called process data. It's outputting position and velocity. And so that process data is being used to uh, provide observations of the inertial errors, and then the Coleman filter is, is uh, estimating what those errors are, and then, of course, the errors are, are fed back as corrections to the inertial system. Now, we can contrast that with the so-called tightly coupled architecture, and in this case, uh, the GNSS receiver is outputting measurements, so pseudo range, delta range, for example. Uh, the inertial is doing the same thing, but the Kalman filter obviously is different since now it's processing GNSS measurements instead of GNSS determined position. Uh, tightly integrated uh, architectures are more complicated, uh, but it turns out that they can provide uh, enhanced robustness uh, by taking the geometry into account uh, automatically whereas in a loosely coupled system, you're kind of stuck with whatever geometry impacted the uh, position solution. And in addition, tight coupling permits you to uh, coast for a while, even if you have less than, say, four satellites. So you go down to three satellites, um, the tightly coupled architecture can, can still process those measurements for a while and thereby in, in, in enhance the uh, overall performance. So that's a quick overview of integration, and with that, I'll turn it back to Alan. Thanks very much, Mike, for that solid grounding in inertial aiding principles. In a few minutes more, we're going to go into the current and future possibilities uh, facilitated by new developments in inertial technology. But first, we're going to include uh, a few questions from our audience for the panel. And first off, uh, manufacturer spec sheets often refer to in-run bias stability. Is this different than the biases you were simulating in your presentation, Mike? Well, the, there's different kinds of, of biases, and the ones that I was referring to uh, are usually what we're thinking about are the biases that are present in the system after all compensations have already been applied. Uh, the, the particular issue of in-run bias stability has to do with uh, the fact that your, your turn-on to turn-on biases may change, but assuming that you've got an external aiding to be able to, uh, to, be able to estimate that initial bias value, then the in-run bias stability has to do with how well or how much the bias changes over the course of the operation of the vehicle. And that's critical because, of course, that drives how rapidly you need to have updates and how long you can coast in between updates, things of that nature. But uh, let, me, let me bring John in on this and see if he has some to add. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I was just going to key in on that. An important understanding and observation is that the in-run bias really should represent the bias temperature performance of the gyro. And that is to say that the gyro has been turned on, warmed up, and now the bias errors that you're seeing are due to the temperature changes and the environmental effects of the location of the fog or the IMU. Um, that's kind of the, the key takeaway is that the in-run bias should really be the performance uh, due to the shock vibe and, and temperature, not necessarily the, the turn-on performance, if you will. All the fiber optic gyroscopes have a warm-up period. And that depends on, on the housing and the type. IMUs and INSs are different based on the, the structure and the enclosure. So there is a difference between the, you know, the in-run and the repeatability and, of course, the bias instability. So we're really looking at the, the bias temperature performance in terms of the in-run uh, bias stability. 
Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mike, can you explain the concept of observability in a Kalman filter? Sure. Well, that's a that's a that's a big question, and uh, what it the 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 issue in observability is the fact that uh, let's say we're taking a loose coupled integration, and and so we have a GPS receiver, and it's providing us with position, and so we have three coordinates of position. And yet, what are we trying to estimate? Well, we're trying to estimate three coordinates of inertial position error, three coordinates of inertial velocity error, uh, three dimensions of, uh, of attitude error at least, maybe some of the sensor biases. And so the point is that we have many, many more unknowns than we have measurements. Now, the way the Kalman filter handles that is in two ways. Number one, of course, it's not a snapshot approach. Uh, it, it takes time, and so it's, it's, it's processing measurements over time. Uh, to be able to estimate more uh, variables than it has uh, measurements at any given epoch. However, even with enough time, there are certain uh, parameters that cannot necessarily be estimated well unless there are some um, outside uh, considerations taken into account. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you have a vehicle that's uh, operating in, say, a roughly straight and constant velocity profile, then it turns out that your heading error or your yaw error in the uh, inertial attitude error, that yaw error is not observable. And we'd have to sp spend some time going through the error equations, the error model, in order to show that. But the fact of the matter is if you're going straight, uh, at constant velocity, you're not able to observe the inertial heading error. And so in order to make that observable, you have to have some lateral acceleration. And so doing some turns or things of that nature is typically the way that the heading error is made observable. But yeah, the, the business of observability is it's a, it's a critical question in the performance of the uh, integration filter. And uh, let's see, I think there's a book, uh, Paul Groves has a book on multi-sensor integration. He's got an excellent section on the observability, but uh, let, me, let me leave it to that for now. All right, thanks. Uh, for both you gentlemen, uh, Mike first and John after, what are the key differences between IMUs for autonomous vehicles versus, say, aircraft applications? Well, one of the uh, one of the major issues with uh, with an aircraft application is that the inertial sensors uh, have to be able to support long periods of unaided performance. And so, uh, if you're putting an inertial system into an airplane that's crossing the ocean, uh, those uh, sensors are what we refer to as nav grade, navigation grade sensors. Uh, and they have to be able to support uh, position uh, determination with error growths that are very small, like on the order of a, a mile per hour of, of error growth. Uh, whereas in, say, uh, autonomous uh, ground vehicles and things of that nature, you're, you're generally not assuming that you need the inertial for that to coast for that length of time. Uh, and as a result, then, you can certainly uh, design an acceptable system uh, with, uh, uh, with components that are, are not, uh, not quite so stringent in their tolerance. But let me turn it over to Jim. Yeah, um, that was actually a, a great summary. Um, Navigation-grade performance, we, one nautical mile per hour, is, is in the domain of what we call navigation-grade fogs. And those are 0 0.01 degree per hour is a traditional figure of merit for bias instability of navigation-grade fogs. So at the high level, it's performance. It's the bias instability, low noise, so it has a low angle random walk, as well as very good bias temperature and scale factor temperature performance. Uh, those are the key differentiators. Of course, there's other things such as lifetime and redundancy that have to be taken into account for uh, a space and flight application. Um, for ground-based vehicles, and we're going to get into this in my talk, if you had a better sensor, if you had a navigation or strategic sensor, you will absolutely want to use that. So the, the inhibitors up until now has been cost and trying to get the navigation grade performance at an affordable cost for an autonomous vehicle has been the challenge. So that's the challenge that KVH has uh, pursued and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So you're going to find a lot more 
uh, detail on, on this subject. And I will talk about the performance grades and some of the high-level uh, trade-offs in my talk. And speaking of detail, John, you, you mentioned in your reply just now 0 0.01 degree per hour. That's a good cue in, for, Lori, for our next polling question before we go on with John's presentation. Uh, let's find out what the audience thinks about this. Okay, yep, coming up on your screen uh, is that next poll question. <clears throat> and we'd like to know, if cost were no object, um, what level of gyroscope bias and stability performance would uh, allow unaided navigation? And this is with disregard for obstacle avoidance. Okay, so uh, I'm going to leave that um, those responses up on the screen for just a moment here to let our panel members uh, digest, and uh, then we'll be going to our second speaker. Um, but um, Alan, any thoughts here? Well. The key, the key part of the question is the first uh, five words, if cost were no object. Well, of course, if cost were no object, we'd like to go with the highest performance we can possibly get. And that's what the uh, plurality, at least, of our uh, respondents seem to be answering. I'm going to defer further uh, detailed analysis uh, of, the, of these answers. Uh, to John uh, at some point in his presentation or perhaps early on. Uh, let's go without any further ado. Uh, John Kahn is Principal Optical Design Engineer at KVH Industries Inertial Navigation. He's responsible for the research and development of fiber-based and photonic-based inertial sensors. He's been involved in the research and development of fiber optic gyroscopes for more than eight years and holds numerous patents in the field. He received his PhD from the University of Connecticut in nanotechnology and is an active member of the AIM Photonics Integrated Photonic Systems Roadmap Sensors Division. John, let's hear about the exciting new developments in photonic chips and fiber optic gyros. Thank you, Alan. Great. So let's start off with a little introduction. Uh, we're KVH Industries. We were founded in 1982. We have over 700 employees worldwide. We have our headquarters in Middletown, Rhode Island, and a manufacturing facility in Tinley Park, Illinois. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about our fiber optic gyroscopes, more specifically our photonic fogs, and this is part of our inertial navigation segment. Uh, today, we've sold over 100,000 plus fiber-based fiber optic gyroscopes, and we are the market leader in uh, precision fogs and the only company to develop and commercialize a photonic fog, and that's going to be the, the topic of today's uh, discussion. So to understand where the fog fits in, in in the space, it's the heart of every system. So the fiber optic gyroscope and, of course, the photonic fog is utilized in our IMUs as well as our inertial navigation systems. And these different systems, of course, incorporate different sensors. So the IMU, of course, has three gyros, three accelerometers. We do include a GPS receiver, for example, and auxiliary sensor inputs in the INS system, which also has a, an estimator and a common filter, as just was described for a final navigation solution. So the building block is a fiber optic gyroscope for all these systems. And so this is a, the key technology that needs to be available to utilize different levels of integration uh, for the autonomous solution. So. Let's talk a little bit about the fog level performance. Um, so we know that the INS, the inertial navigation system, is a solution for dead reckoning applications. And as you can see from the poll, uh, if money was no object, everyone would want a strategic grade fog. Uh, this is because in autonomous applications, there are many GPS denied environments that are observed. Some are the urban canyons, for example, cities, tunnels, there are severe weather events where GPS is knocked out, and of course there's military applications where GPS cannot be trusted. Uh, so these are all encompassing in the GPS denied environment. So if we could have a strategic grade INS system or FOG in, at a low cost, we would use them in our autonomous applications. Unfortunately, we can't afford to put a, a million dollar or $500,000 FOG in a conventional economy car. So, uh, so it's one key takeaway is that in the absence of collision avoidance, we would like to dead reckon with a high-performance fog. Uh, 
And so what we are want to say is in terms of resolution, we want centimeter level precision in the duration of a few minutes, right? And that's the typical unaided in the GPS denied environment um, time frame in which we'd like to, to navigate while maintaining centimeter level precision. And it turns out that that's around the navigation grade performance regime, which is about 0 0.01 uh, degrees per hour. And this domain is, is dominated by fogs. Of course, until today, the, the price was too high to be used in, in conventional automobiles. Um, so how do we approach this problem? Well, we've leveraged silicon photonics to enable us to, to tackle this problem, to provide a reliable, high performance, scalable, and of course, uh, smaller fog to be used in these systems for autonomous applications. And I'm going to go into details today about what that means and how we are seeing the performance improvements. Um, great. So let's uh, spend some time going over a conventional optical circuit of a fiber optic gyroscope and what we've done and, and what we're seeing here as performance improvements. And it, it's, it's a, a wonderful thing. So first, the conventional fog is comprised of multiple components that are fiber-based components. So we have a pigtailed source, we have a detector, we have a first coupler, linear polarizer, and a second coupler. Now this is a conventional two by two fiber optic gyroscope schematic. And conventionally, each one of these fiber-based components are hand-built. They are tested, of course, and then put together via splicing. So the, the individual labor involved with building each component, as well as the yield from testing, actually makes this a non-scalable solution for high-volume automotive and autonomous applications. So there are three major components and, of course, five splices that are associated with that. So intrinsically, we have to understand that these components are sensitive to environmental um, aspects. So temperature, shock, vibration, all affect couplers. And if you uh, work in the fiber optic sensors of all types, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These split ratio, for example, the bend losses, the wavelength dependent losses are variable coupler to coupler, build to build. And of course, over the temperature environments that are required for the, for the uh, solution. So these are one of the, the, the big hurdles is fiber-based components have high variability. They're, they're difficult to make. Um, they are susceptible to environmental stressors like bending the fiber. Uh, of course, heating up the coupler changes things like the split ratio. So what we can do is by monolith monolithically integrating these fiber components into one photonic chip, we actually eliminate a lot of these insensitivities. So we've eliminated five splices. And I'm uh, showing four here. There's also one on the detector leg. We've eliminated five splices, and that also eliminates the reliability issue with having a splice that needs to be recoded and proof tested that's common in fiber-based sensors. So we don't have to do that anymore. So now we have an intrinsically reliable uh, heart, if you will, the system right here of the fog. So we've been able to actually decrease the optical loss of the system by incorporating all of these components on one silicon photonic chip. And we're seeing about 3 dB uh, decrease in loss and this is due to the low propagation loss of the design, as well as the elimination of all the losses at the interfaces and splices. So intrinsically, splice loss is relatively low, but there is a splice loss along the fabrication of the gyro. Um, this is no longer a problem when it's monolithically integrated onto one silicon photonic chip. So this is fantastic. Now, the lower loss also has pro advantages that propagate through the system. And those are predominantly seen at the source. And so what we're seeing is now we have an increase in lifetime of the device, as well as increased lifetime. And the reason being that because the loss in the optical circuit has gone down, we now have to drive the SLD at a, a lower drive current. So we have lower current densities in the, in, the, in the junction. We have longer lifetimes for full performance. So typically the lifetime would be based on power. And now with a lower optical source, we have much higher headroom of the SLD. Um, so lifetime is, you know, let, we'll say angle round walk limited, but we are now 3 dB above uh, in the loss budget to, to meet those requirements. So this is kind of like a, a byproduct, a fantastic uh, byproduct of going to a photonic chip is the lower loss optical circuit. Um, one thing to, to, to mention is in terms of scalability and repeatability, 
we are now leveraging the benefits of a foundry level fabrication process. So instead of building each one of these couplers and polarizers and splicing it together and testing each single one, we have now we can leverage lithography, etching, deposition techniques at the at the foundry level to make these components monolithically. And so what does that mean? That means that we're able to produce top tier performance photonic fogs with great repeatability. And we're going to go into some of those uh, details and figures of merit. So on the same note, we want to take advantage of the uh, mature semiconductor quality processes. And that's something that that's not to be taken lightly. Um, the processes that, that have been developed, you know, for decades in terms of silicon photonics, testing, fabrication, and qualification uh, are orders of magnitude improvement in, uh, you know, single fiber-based component testing and qualification. So this includes a lot wafer and pick level test and verification processes that we can verify design, test, and release. And this is a, a step, an order of magnitude increase when, I, like I said, compared to fiber-based uh, processes for verification and testing. So now we have the ability to test and release, let's say, a few thousand picks at a time uh, instead of individually testing couplers and, and polarizers. So it's really important to understand that the, the labor, the fabrication, the testing in fiber-based components is not a scalable solution. The scalable solution is actually to do a monolithically integrated photonic chip, which we have done. Um, great. So now that we've talked a little bit about the advantages of migrating from an all fiber fog to a, a photonic fog, let's discuss some examples of performance. So I've, I've talked about um, the repeatability and the wafer level verification testing and design that we can do. So what does that mean for gyro performance, right? What does it ultimately afford us uh, in the autonomous space? So here we're just showing a conventional 1725 fiber optic gyroscope uh, figures of merit. Uh, specifications. And first, we should realize that these specifications are already an order of magnitude better than a MEMS-based device. Um, of course, no one wants a poor performing gyro. So the MEMS-based gyros are archaic compared to fog technology. And now with a photonic fog that brings the C-swap down, they're uh, <laughs> obsolete. Our 1725 spec um, is here. And what we've what I'm showing here now in the next few slides will be uh, performance figures of merit that we've been demonstrated with the photonic fogs. And what you're going to realize is that we've been able to demonstrate top tier performance within our spec with the photonic fog. And so an example of that would be uh, bias instabilities of 0 0.02 degrees per hour. So our typical, our specifications 0.1 degree per hour, 0 0.05 degree per hour typical, and now we're operating in the top percentile of that specification. So 0 0.02 degrees per hour is near navigation grade. If we use the 0 0.01 degree per hour figure of merit as the hard uh, merit for navigation grade. So we are now already seeing order of magnitude improvement um, from the standard specification, if you will. <laughs> and so now it's two orders of magnitude or greater uh, performance when compared to a MEMS device. Of course, the, uh, the angle random walk follows in terms of performance improvement. And we are seeing here top tier performance in angle random walk. So a 0 0.01 degree per square hour, for example. And so these are the, the two, if you will, figures of merit that you would look at when choosing a gyro uh, conventionally. Now, one thing to mention is the two uh, figures of merit that are very important environmentally and for autonomous applications are actually scale factor temperature and bias temperature. And this is not to be taken lightly, right? So like I alluded to earlier, when the, the vehicle's operating and this, or the solution is operating, the performance of the gyro is gonna be dictated by what's happening in the environment. So the reason that we're seeing a lot of these performance increases and per performing in the top percentile of our specification is because we don't have all the sensitivities that we did with fiber-based components. So scale factor temperature, we're just showing here under 50 part per million. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Bias temperature, we're showing um, well below one degree per hour. So uh, fantastic performance, if you will, from the, the monolithically integrated solution because we don't have the sensitivities of the all fiber components. Um, so very excited about, uh, about that. 
Great. So uh, we just discussed some of the advantages of migrating from the all fiber fog and, uh, and what we're seeing for the top tier percentile. And what I wanted to talk about is now some of the details and, re and repeatability of the performance. So one thing is a, is a specification. Another is to go into details on the build to build repeatability of the gyro. So here we're seeing an example of a triad of, of gyros. And so we're able to see 0 0.23, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 degree per hour. Remember in the, in the previous slide, uh, I said sub one degree per hour bias temperature performance. So once again, uh, we are in the top tier of our specification, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees per hour for bias temperature, which is a very important figure of merit for an actual vehicle, right? It's operating in temperatures that for this case, negative 40 to 80 degrees C we're showing, and it's operating in these environments. It's not in a laboratory. So this is a real world performance bias that you have to deal with, right? And we have scale factor temperature here. We're showing once again, 43 part per million, 57 part per million, you know, 12 part per million scale factor temperature performance. So 0.004%, right? And 0.001% uh, scale factor is over temperature is fantastic. So these type of build to build repeatability for figures of merits, we're seeing because of the monolithic, monolithically integrated circuit moving away from fiber-based components. Um, and this is not to be taken lightly. This is uh, very important to understand. Great, and so another example here would be the uh, extremely low bias and scale factor errors. Um, another triad, so I, I, I put the now the conventional figures of merit on a different build. So we have a triad of photonic fogs and I just like to show you some of the bias instability and angle random walk from axis to axis. Uh, so we're actually seeing here sub 0 0.01 degree per square root hour angle random walk across X, Y, and Z gyros. And of course, we're seeing uh, bias instabilities here of uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.01 on a different triad. So once again, on this, on this triad, we're showing top tier performance of the photonic fog. Um, this is now something that is well-defined, well-observable, and is now providing two orders of magnitude performance improvement, not just in the uh, laboratory angle random walk or bias instability, but in real-world bias temperature and scale factor temperature performance. Uh, this is a key takeaway. So in order to have a solution that works, that can be easily modeled, uh, that can be incorporated into an INS with a, a common filter, you need to have the repeatability, not only uh, gyro to gyro, which we're demonstrating, but of course, uh, along itself, right? So bias temperature performance needs to be restrained. Uh, scale factor temperature performance needs to be restrained. So when we're talking about sub 50 part per million and we just talked about uh, you know, a few gyros that showed 12 part per million or 42 part per million, we're well within the top percentile of our spec and we're very, very excited to, to actually present this data. So in conclusion, uh, we've uh, demonstrated a photonic fog that, that allows a scalable, reliable, and high-performance solution for the market. And what we're really bringing to the market is two orders of magnitude improvement in uh, performance when compared to the MEMS-based devices. So for the first time in, in decades, we've uh, leveraged new innovative technology and actually changed the, uh, the face of the fiber optic gyroscope world. Uh, we're no longer bound by the fiber-based components. And now we're starting to see all the benefits of uh, the development and the benefits of our photonic solution. So we're very excited to bring the, the new solution to the market. Thank you. Back to you, Alan. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we've got a, a slate of questions here for both panelists, and we'll get to those in just a moment, or in just a few moments. We're going to give the audience uh, now a chance to look at some resources. Uh, further resources for following up on some of the material you've seen uh, presented here. Uh, and by the way, I should add that uh, this full webinar, the slides and the audio, will be made available to you to re-listen uh, at, at a later point if you want to review the material that these two gentlemen have presented. But here are some further resources, the Robotic Research Study, the Chip Tech eBook, 
and the high-end tactical grade fog based on PIC, uh, all resources on the KVH website, and then some uh, technical references from Mike's talk, uh, three textbooks on principles of inertial navigation. Uh, before we get to our further questions for the panel, Lori, let's uh, have one final polling question for our audience. Absolutely. Um, on your screen is that last question. How many years until the U.S. market realizes full autonomous, no driver interface capability in standard production cars? One to two years, two to five, five to ten, or ten to fifteen? What do you think? Okay, one percent with a one to two years, thirteen percent, two to five, thirty-eight percent, five to ten, and forty-nine percent saying ten to fifteen years. Uh, what are your thoughts there, Alan? Well, obviously, it's a ways out in the future, or, or most people think it is. Uh, but as we, as we sometimes like to say in the high-tech industry, the future is closer than it may appear. Uh, at least we, uh, there's a lot of preparation for it. Uh, so even though uh, full-scale autonomy on the nation's highways is, is, is a bit out there, uh, it's coming, and it's coming fast, and this is exactly why we publish Inside Autonomous Systems Magazine. If you don't currently have a subscription, uh, this is something that will be of inestimable value to you in uh, gauging the, uh, the oncoming approach of many autonomous platforms. Uh, thanks very much for that, Lori. I'm going to go now to questions from our audience for the panel. Uh, John, your presentation outlined some exciting new technology. How do these innovations change the landscape of inertial guidance, and what does this mean for the market? It's a good question. So for the first time in decades, we're actually able to uh, rewrite the C-swap limitations. So the cost, size, weight, and power limitations have been driven by uh, conventional fiber-based components. So fiber was uh, 135 micron, and they've been driving it the size down. Uh, optical couplers were three inches and four inches long, and over the decades, they've been shrunk down to, let's just say, an inch or so. But those have limited uh, swap capabilities, so they're still lossy components. They're still large. They still suffer from bend loss. And so it's really the first time in decades that we've seen a, a new technology come in and, and actually rewrite the C-swap curve, and I think we're just beginning to see the uh, applications that the photonic fog will be used in. I think that uh, the unparalleled performance, one to two orders of magnitude compared to a, a MEMS-based device, uh, will actually completely change the landscape of guidance over the next few years. Uh, so we're very, very excited. And while we see those changes start to roll out across the landscape, what's next up in your development lab? Uh, what can we expect to see for the next generation? <laughs> That's a great question. A lot of people ask that. Um, it's, it's the constant pursuit of uh, obtaining the ultimate C-swap. So we're always looking at all the drivers. And, and like I've alluded to, for example, the low loss had benefits in terms of reliability and lifetime. So we're always looking at different benefits and, and adjusting the performance and adjusting the design to, to meet our goals. So it's ultimately the pursuit of the low C-swap. Uh, so we will be attacking those targets consistently and uh, continuing development to make that better. Thank you. Uh, I have a rather technical question uh, here. Well, these are all technical questions. What can I say? But uh, someone in the audience wants to know is how will all this be incorporated into the testing stack? That is to say, uh, SIL, MIL, HIL. And uh, Mike, if you want to feel that one first, and please uh, define for the audience those three terms. Sure. Well, the you know, software in the loop, hardware in the loop, that's what we're talking about. And uh, it's basically a, a, a layered approach. Uh, normally, when uh, you're first uh, looking at uh, system design, you, you start out with a software in the loop. Uh, approach uh, and you know frequently with the standard test tools that are available today and MATLAB Simulink things of that nature uh, and what you 
are doing to begin with is just looking at the major contributors to the system performance, so the sensor biases and and uh, and, and the noise values, things of that nature. And, and you know, typically you're doing a software uh, analysis in order to determine your initial uh, design architecture. Then. Uh, as time goes on, of course, uh, you improve your your uh, fidelity of your software simulation, uh, and then towards the end is when you're looking at building prototypes and 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 then doing uh, doing actual hardware in the loop testing. That's the uh, advantage we have nowadays uh, is that the fact that the software tools are so good uh, that uh, it really minimizes the the need for a lot of uh, a lot of cut and try at the at the hardware level. John, anything to add to that yes. about uh, testing? Yes, I was just going to add to that. Um, we actually use a multi-tiered approach as well in terms of the development of our systems. So we do hardware in the loop testing for for hardware integration of the sensor and testing. So for changing things, uh, changing coils or, or making a change, we will actually do the hardware in the loops. So we run uh, ray tables with the full system on top. When we go up to uh, an IMU or we go to an INS system, now we start migrating into, there's obviously hardware in the loop for verification, but software in the loop as well because now we're tuning and adjusting the INS system based on the behavior of the fog, right? So we're using the, the model-based behavior uh, in software to do the software in the loop. So it's a multi-tier approach from a sensor and then INS development uh, approach. All right, thanks very much. Mike, going to turn back to you with a question. Uh, someone wants to know your professional opinion and preference between phi angle error model and psi angle error model. Okay, well, that's a, that's a very, very detailed question, and it has to do with how you're actually modeling the attitude error in the inertial. Uh, and in the uh, uh, phi angle, what you're doing is you're actually modeling the entire attitude error, whereas with a psi angle approach, you're modeling uh, a, a key component in the attitude error, and, and, and so the, those are two different uh, design philosophies in terms of the error modeling. Uh, the the uh, psi angle uh, model has the advantage of uh, producing um, well, essentially, the different components of the of the uh, uh, state transition matrix are, are separated because uh, there's not as much cross coupling, and so essentially, psi angle uh, provides you with a simpler set of equations to deal with in terms of the overall uh, the overall state model. Uh, phi angle has the advantage of the fact that it's it's directly modeling the total attitude error. Uh, but the uh, side issue is that it's a it's a much more messy set of equations, so it's 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 just a classic trade off. And um, as far as you know, in my experience, both are perfectly valid, and it's almost almost personal preference. All right, thanks, John. A question to you about the photonic based fog: Why is your input rate lower? in the photonic-based fog compared to the baseline fog? That's a great question. So on the on my comparison, that was the uh, 150 degrees per second was the requirement, if you will, for land-based vehicle. Um, all the data that I've shown, those fiber optic gyroscopes actually have a 490 degree per uh, second max rate. So they are the same as a 1725 dynamic range. Um, thank you for asking that question. That, I want to make that very clear. So all the, the bias and angle random walk uh, data, of course, the scale factor temp and bias temp data that we've sh uh, shared is with gyros, um, are with gyros that go up to 490 degrees per second. And a follow-up question to that, what is your swap size, weight, and power for the photonic fog-based IMU? Great question, and uh, I don't have the final um, size, weight, and power for the full IMU. Uh, you can imagine that, I can comment that we've brought the uh, couplers and polarizers, which would conventionally take up a few inches uh, of space, down to a few millimeters. So 
we have a significant swap uh, decrease in the optical circuit. Um, in terms of the final IMU, that's, that has yet to be seen. But thank you for that question. All right. Turning back to the Kalman filter, Mike, is it possible to average out errors in inertial uh, units by mixing several INS units together into a Kalman filter? Uh, that's a that's a great question, and it's one that a lot of people ask. and And it would be so nice if we could. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't. Uh, the The idea of averaging, you know, you've got a chip scale sensor, so why don't you know put a thousand of them on on a small package, and then you know be able to get a be able to get a tremendous uh, reduction through averaging. Uh, and that's so appealing, uh, but unfortunately, the reality is it doesn't work that way uh, for the primary fact that uh, a lot of the key errors are uh, common mode, uh, and so uh, you, you don't get the uh, averaging, the least squares reduction that you think. You can get some. I don't want to say that it's useless, uh, but it turns out that the that you know, if you put a thousand of these things on a on a wafer, uh, that enough of the errors are common uh, that you you just don't get that least squares averaging. Jo uh, John might have some things to add on this. Yep, that's actually I agree holistically. The averaging of poor sensors does not make a good sensor. <laughs> You're still going to be limited by the noise, the angle random walk. So you still have a noise floor that's intrinsic of that sensor design. Uh, so what you really want to do is now have a high-end sensor. You want to have lower angle random walk. You want to have low integrated noise. You want to have better bias stability. So um, the answer is simply to move to a better sensor. If you wanted to use a high-performance sensor, a, a fog for one axis, and look at compromises in the other because they're not as important, that's something that you can look at. Um, but there is no replacement for high-performance. And uh, that's true with uh, aviation and a uh, very high-end autonomous vehicles, you believe they use navigation grade or better uh, fogs due to this limitation in noise. All right, and since we're uh, talking about the Kalman filter, uh, is it possible to detect faults in nav to detect faults in navigation sensors using statistics from a Kalman filter and then be able to reject the faulted sensor? The, uh, the answer to that is yes, in some cases, uh, and the common filter is able to determine uh, errors if they are sudden. And so if you have a sensor that, that has a sudden step or jump, uh, as long as it's sufficiently large, uh, then the filter is able to detect uh, that kind of error. So again, we call them uh, step errors or just any, any kind of sudden error, then the filter is able to detect that. Um, whereas if you have a very slowly growing error, then the filter just absorb it, absorbs it as a natural part of its processing. So in some cases, uh, it can be done. And in fact, uh, you can you see that you know, even in the, the, uh, the, the literature, they talk about the use of the Kalman filter for outlier rejection uh, and, and that's that's where it shines the most uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of fault sensor detection all right uh, going back to the photonic fog chip uh, John you've outlined some uh, exciting new possibilities how soon somebody wants to know will kvh photonic fog chips become available for board level integration similar to MEMS IMU chips? That's a great question, John. So they are ready, if you will, uh, for board level integration. The coil today is not on chip. And so there is a fiber to chip, if you will, interface. Um, the actual photonic chip is being incorporated into board level integration today. So um, I hope that answers your question. All right. Uh, we've run through the immediate uh, questions submitted by our audience. Uh, I'm going to 
pause for a minute or two and extemporate here uh, to give a chance for any final questions to come in. Uh, in the meantime, I want to remind our audience that, again, you will get an email uh, with full access to the um, entire contents of the webinar, and we encourage you to share these contents uh, with your uh, peers and colleagues or just encourage them to go to the Inside GNSS website. There is, an, uh, there is a, a registration page. The webinar will be available for download uh, subsequent to this live presentation, so uh, share it uh, far and wide. I want to thank all of our panelists today for presenting this exciting new material and the foundational material that makes it possible inertial navigation as Mike opened his presentation open the webinar the future of navigation is inertial plus and plus being uh, one of the key terms there and of course the the way that inertial is integrated with other sensors is going to be the uh, the critical element in uh, high precision navigation for autonomous platforms and many other applications of inertial technology. John, Michael, I want to thank you both for your presentations. Any concluding comments for the audience? Well, thank you for uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address uh, the audience and. Uh, I think uh, we've got an exciting future with the development of these new sensors, and uh, it's it's going to have a revolutionary impact on on the uh, on the autonomous market. Thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. If you have any questions or additional technical questions, please reach out to Sean McCormick, and we can always have a, a technical call and we can discuss your questions in detail privately. Thank you. All right. Thanks once again to the audience for attending. Thanks to Michael and John for their presentations. Thanks to KVH Inertial Navigation Industries for making this webinar possible. And Lori, back to you. All right. Uh, just reiterating, thank you all for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one and bye for now.